In this video, we're going to take into account the reactions, or we're going to calculate the reactions due to a distributed load with linearly varying load intensity. So you can see on the screen here, I have um, our beam. It's the same, it's essentially the same kind of distributed load that we had the last time, or in other words, it extends over the same parts of the beam. It's just that now I have made the load intensity start at 10 kilonewtons per meter and reduce linearly down to zero. Okay, so this, the, the approach that we're gonna to take to this is gonna be pretty much identical to how we dealt with the uniformly distributed load. All we have to do is work out where the resultant force is and what's the magnitude of the resultant. And once we've got those two pieces of information, the process proceeds exactly the same as it did for a uniformly distributed load. Now, the extra, I guess, complication or the extra step that we have to do with this uh, type of loading is we have two scenarios to take into account, two possible scenarios. The first is where we have the load intensity on the left side being non-zero, essentially, um, and the load intensity on the right being zero. That's case A, let's call it. And then case B is where our load is reversed. So we might have zero, or we would have zero on the left-hand side of the distributed load, and a non-zero load intensity over on the right. And depending on which of those two scenarios that we fall into, which of those two cases we're in, uh, we're gonna have slightly different code. And so we're gonna have to build that into our, into our notebook code, into our Python code. So let's start off here by working out for case A and case B, what would the equation look like uh, for the magnitude of the resultant force and its location? So let's start off here and let's call it case A, right? So we'll say, let's go with black, we'll say case, case A, right? So let's draw out a little sort of a sub diagram for case A. Remember the whole objective here is to work out what's the magnitude of the resultant, where is it? And once we've got that, we can basically just reuse the same code that we had uh, when we were looking at uniformly distributed loads. Because again, with the UDLs, we ended up again working out what was the resultant and where was its location. And once we had that information, it was just like dealing with a point load. All right, so let's uh, let's get our, our little sketch out here. So we've got, um, very simple sketch. So this, the case is going to be where we have a non-zero load intensity on the left-hand side, right? And let's draw on the, the different variables that we're going to need. So I'm going to call the load intensity here at the start, right? I'm going to call that FY subscript start. All right, because that's going to feature in our equations. Now, this is a distributed load, and so it's going to be, we can represent it with an equivalent point load and that's going to have a magnitude f y underscore res and it's going to be located a distance in from the left hand support or from the left hand side of our beam i should say more accurately that's going to be x underscore res okay so they're the key variables that are going to pop up in our equation right so let's work out what would f y res be right well look it's just the area of the triangle so that's going to be equal to it's going to be equal to what is it not point Five times um, F Y start times. Now let me see the two variables I haven't drawn on here are X and minus X start. Okay, but I've drawn them on the bigger diagram up here. So X end is just the, the, the coordinate of the end at the end of my uh, distributed load. And X start is just the location of the coordinate of the starting point of the distributed load. So now that we have F Y res, uh, we can then go ahead and work out what is, what is X res, the location of that resultant. Well, we know that for a linearly uh, varying load or a load with a linearly varying intensity, in other words, a triangular load distribution, we know that the resultant acts one third the way along uh, the base of the triangle. So if I was to just come up here for a second, right, and consider that as the full base of the triangle, well, we know that the resultant force will act, if that's, that's gonna be one third of the base, and this would be two thirds of the base distance. So it's always the same for a triangular load distribution. Right, so with all that, we can say then that the resultant is located at a distance x start plus one third x end minus x start. Okay, excellent. All right, so that's x start gets us over to, x start gets us over to, uh, wait till we see, over to this point over here, and then one third x end minus x start gets us that little extra bit over there. 
All right, so now that's case A dealt with. We have an expression for the resultant force, its location, um, and it's, like I say, just like dealing with a point with a uniformly distributed load from this point on. So now let's draw a little vertical line here and think about case B, the other option that our code is going to have to accommodate. So let's see case B here. So case B is just where the load is flipped, right? So we're going to have uh, a zero load intensity on the left-hand side leading up to some other non-zero load intensity on the right. And we'll draw on the, uh, let me see, the height of this load intensity is going to be F, Y, subscript, end. All right, and again, we're gonna have our resultant comes on something like this. Let's call that F, Y, res, the same as before. And it's located at X, res. So again, fairly straightforward exercise here. F, Y, res is going to be equal to 0.5, right? 0.5 times the base times the height, right? So the, the, the height is going to be F, Y, underscore, end. And the base is going to be X, end, minus X, start. And then X, res is going to be equal to x start plus two thirds this time, uh, two thirds of x end minus x start. All right, so now at this point, we have all the information we need to now jump over to our Jupyter notebook and just uh, write the code to take, uh, to take this type of loading into account for our reactions. All right, so over in our Jupyter Notebook now, we are ready to start uh, making the edits. Now the edits are gonna, at this point, at this point in this sort of series, um, I guess you can pretty much see where we're going or the, the path we're gonna take here. Uh, we're gonna make our three edits to the first three code cells here, like we usually do. Uh, now, what did I call these loads? These were linear loads, I think we called them. So linear loads, again, just initializing just initializing an empty array so our code doesn't break if we don't happen to have any linear loads um, defined. Distributed loads with linearly varying intensity. And let's say, what, how are we gonna define these loads? Well, we'll define the starting position, the ending position. We'll then define, um, we'll then define start magnitude and and magnitude. Next, we can come down and actually define the load that gets applied to our structure. So what have we got then? We've got, uh, we'll call this linear loads. Now it starts at eight meters. It ends at 17 meters. Its starting magnitude is a minus 10. So 10 kilonewtons per meter acting down and its end or final magnitude is gonna be zero. And then we have to come in here and define our test our test variable. So let's say n LDL we'll define it as, and that's going to be equal to the length of linear loads zero. And let's just be consistent with our notes here. So we'll say this is a test for linearly varying magnitude distributed loads. And as I see that, I see we have a typo in there. Okay. Excellent, so they're the first three changes that we needed to make. So we can come on down now and come below where I've defined a function to calculate reactions due to UDLs. So you'll see I've already defined the heading in here. We wanna define a function to calculate the reactions now due to linearly varying distributed loads. And again, it's gonna be very, very similar to this, right? So let's just go ahead and define reactions LDL. And it takes N as an input parameter. And in the usual way, we'll extract off some of the key information just to make it easier to access. All right, so next comes this uh, this test, right? We've got to work out, are we dealing with case A or case B? Now, the quick way to work this out is to ask yourself or to write the code that asks the question, is FY start, is, is it greater than zero? Is it a non-zero number, basically, right? So if, we can't just say if FY start greater than zero, because remember, we're defining vertical forces that act downwards as negative numbers. And so we can't just check is it greater than zero. What we have to do is actually check is it any number that is not zero. And in order to do that, we're gonna check the absolute version of it. So we're gonna take whatever the number is, get the absolute or positive version of it, and we're gonna see is that greater than zero. So if the absolute value of F, Y, start, 
and I think I should define these with a lowercase s and a lowercase e. So if the absolute value of f y start, if that happens to be greater than zero, well then we know we're dealing with case a, in which case we can put in the formula that we'd worked out a second ago for the resultant and its location. So the resultant was going to be equal to 0 0.5 times, um, we don't need brackets there, 0 0.5 times f y start times x end minus x start. All right, so that should be f y res. Now, where is it located? It's going to be located at x start. Now, this was case A, and so we had one third. So this was going to be one third of x end minus x start all right so if it's not that case right well then well then we'll just say else it's got to be case b in which case we'll put in the following so again it's actually the same formula the only difference is this is going to say x end rather than x start All right, and then we can say x res is going to be, again, same formula. It's just that this one third gets changed to two thirds. Now that we've worked out what is f y res and what is x res, depending on case A or case B, we just all we're dealing with now is a point load acting on our beam at a, at a known location, which was the exact same as the as the uh, scenario here that we dealt with previously for a UDL and so we can take all of this code and copy it down so let's drop all that in there and it's going to do it's going to do the job we needed to do so working out VA and VB so let's execute that cell all right we don't seem to have any syntax errors let's come on down and cycle through all of the LDLs and determine the reactions again the same structure that we've seen numerous times now at this point so we'll just say LDL LDL let me see record again just defining our empty bucket here let's just copy this drop it in there and now do our test if n LDL if that happens to be greater than zero let's come in here and execute our function for each of our distributed loads linearly varying distributed loads so I'm going to copy all of this in fact drop it in here and then skim through and make sure I make the edits so this is going to be linear loads this is going to be reactions LDL is the appropriate function and then we're going to append onto LDL here. To be able to run this code now and just check that our reactions are being calculated appropriately. Okay, so when we try and run it, we run into our first typo, which was I had two equal signs up here in our very second code block. So let's try that again. And in fact, before we run it, let's just comment out all of these guys so we're only dealing with the distributed load. Our reactions are calculated as 9 kilonewtons for the left-hand side and 36 kilonewtons for the right-hand side, which a quick hand calculation will confirm is correct. Okay, so that's all we wanted to achieve in this video. We're going to come back in the next and final video in this series and we're going to work out how to take into account this kind of loading for the calculation of our shear force and bending moment diagram. So we'll pick that discussion up in the next video.